and welcome to Zero to She Ro, uh, part one, um, introduction to R. Before we get started, just want to let you know what we have planned for this amazing year for all of you. Um, you can keep up to date with everything we're doing at Our Lady Stryberg on Twitter. You can follow all the co-organizers, uh, me, Elisa, and Kyla. Um, you can also get information on our meetups on meetup.com. We have almost all the material that we use on GitHub as well. And today, without much ado, um, Kyla, Yulia, over to you. Well, welcome to our Zero to Shiro event series. We're really excited to be doing this. And we hope that there's something in here for everyone. So R is something that both me and Yulia love a lot. And so we're really happy to share it, especially with um, motivated women and women who want to get into um, to get into like a new skill set. So we're really happy to have everybody here. And yeah, welcome to R. If this is your first experience with R, we're really happy to be hosting you on that. Uh, it's a really great um, programming language and skill set for a bunch of reasons, including that it's totally free, so you never have to pay for anything to do with R. Really, the um, developer environment that will show you the programming language, all of the add-ons, all of those are um, free and, and ac accessible to anyone for that reason. Um, yeah, you can also find a lot of free tutorials and um, workshops going on in the community, so it's really great. It's also an open source language, which means that anyone can contribute to it. So R itself, if it's missing some sort of a key technique or ability, then anyone with like advanced R skills can develop packages and contribute them to this to the community for anyone to use. And we're going to show you how to use one of our favorite packages um, a little bit later in this workshop. R is also a scripting language, which makes it different from programming languages or programs like SPSS that are point and click. And while that has a slightly steeper learning curve, it's definitely worth it because that means that your scripts and your projects will be reproducible and transparent. You'll be able to share what you did with anyone else and also to remember yourself what, what you actually did to get to a certain result. R is also pretty established. It has a lot of tutorials and help pages. If you run into trouble with R, you can always look on Stack Overflow or Google or um, on the R, R stats Twitter, which has a lot of people that um, contribute to like help pages. And maybe most importantly, R is like a really amazing inclusive community. So the R community does a lot for R ladies, for gender minorities, but also for minorities of um, all types. So it's very inclusive and it's a big point of the R um, consortium and R studio group to make sure that everybody can access R. Okay, so um, this is a nice little joke about yeah, why are open source languages the best? Because they are. <laughs> okay, and so we sent around some installation instructions for you yesterday. I hope that everybody got that um, and was able to download R and R Studio. If not, um, please write in the chat and we'll see if maybe, maybe I can give you a hand. If you're uh, watching this maybe on YouTube later at the recording and you wanna know, then we've also, um, Put some installation instructions up on our GitHub, which we will link to. Okay, so without further ado, I want to show you our studio. I'm going to go ahead and open it. So you can follow along with me while we do this. Um, if you're opening our studio for the first time, or maybe you're not so familiar with our studio, then when you open it, it looks like this. You can see there's three panels when you open it. Um, there's a little bit of information about your R version. I think the most recent version is 4.0.3 at the moment. 
but anything that's kind of up there close to 3.94 should be fine for this tutorial. If you're looking at a number that's like in the low threes, you might want to consider updating your R um, at some point. But for most of the stuff that we're working with, I don't think there'll be a direct problem with that. So our studio is like a developer environment that has a ton of convenient fe convenience features for working with R. And almost everybody that I know that works with R works with it in R studio. And I think it will become clear why, because it's a really great platform and program for working with R. So first thing you could do when you're in R studio is open a new file. I'm going to show you here, open a new file that's just an R script. And you'll see that when you do that, it automatically like opens in a way that you have four panels. So here is your scripting. This is what we'll call your scripting panel. This is where you actually write your R code. Um, down here is your console. That's where your R code is going to show you its, its output. So that's where, um, yeah, when you do something up in the script, it's going to show up, like the result is going to show up down in the console. You have a couple of convenient panels over here as well, which like we'll keep looking at all of these features as we um, keep going, but as a little intro, the environment panel is where you're going to start to see variables when we start working with variables and you're going to see data frames there when we start to read in data frames. There's also a history panel here, um, but that's something that you don't use as much, I would say. By default, this bottom right panel might be open to files, but um, the slightly more convenient um, panel panels that you can show up down here are packages. We're going to show you how to download packages uh, later. And there's also a help panel. So this is a, a panel where you can type in almost any R command and you're going to get some documentation on it. When you're a beginner, the documentation can sometimes be a little bit difficult to understand, like if you're not totally familiar with um, the types of method, um, types of vocabulary and stuff that's in there, but it's definitely like a really good resource for looking up, looking up um, commands that you don't know. Okay, so if you have like a basic R script, the number one or the easiest, most basic thing that R is, is like a very fancy calculator. So you can do any sort of um, like mathematical operations up in your R script, and you can see they're going to pop out the input, or sorry, the output down here in the console panel. And as you add things, you can run each line by clicking on the line and pressing, um, if you're on a Mac, you press Command Enter. And if you're on a Windows, you press Control R. So when you are on a line, you can run that line. You can run multiple lines by highlighting multiple lines. And basically, yeah, you can play around with doing a little bit of math um, up here. Then the only other thing about R script, R scripts like this is you can see that everything is being interpreted as if it was R code. So if I start like, say I want to write like a note to myself and I want to say, this is my practice uh, R page. Then if I try and run this whole script, it's going to complain because this is not R code, right? This is just text. And if I want to leave, so if I want to leave notes to myself in an R script, I have to start it with a hashtag. And then R knows to just ignore that line that that's just a comment for myself as I keep going. And then it won't cause me any problems with, um, yeah, with just using text. Okay, so that was a quick introduction to the R script, but what I want to work with today and what we're going to work with in this tutorial and one of my favorite kind of features of R is the R markdown file, which is similar to an R script, but allows you to work with like a lot of text. So you can put a lot of notes to yourself or we've done it that we, we kind of also have put some instructions in there that you can, that you can read. And you can close that. Like if you had that script open, we're following along, you can close that because we're going to work now within that file. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and open it. And if you're following along, just open it up too. And you'll see that it pops up um, just the same as where the R script was. You can see this is the document I was showing you before. 
because R Markdown is a is a file format that you can easily um, transform into like an HTML file. You can also make a PDF out of this. So this is the same file that I was showing you here. So you can follow along on either of them, but um, I would recommend following along within our studio so that you can actually do the exercises as we go along. So this file is an R markdown file, which I talk about here, which is um, a little bit more complex than an R script. So we saw in the R script that R interprets everything that's in there as being R code. But in an R markdown, you have the opportunity to use both code and text. And you can do a lot of very fancy things with R markdown. Um, and we have actually done a whole meetup on R markdown before, which is recorded on YouTube. I think Yuria will, will also stick that link in the chat for us. And also of an upcoming event that um, one of the other R ladies groups is hosting on R markdown. So if you wanna get more into making your R markdowns fancy, then that's definitely something for you. But for now, I'll just show you the basics. So you'll notice that uh, our markdowns have this little box of information at the top of them. That's just a little bit of info about the file. It's called the YAML information. You don't have to worry about that. And then once you get into our markdown, you see that you can use a lot of text. So in the white space, the basic white space, you can write text. And in the, um, if you want to have our, our code, you have to add a code chunk. So I'll tell you in a minute why this is so great for reproducibility. But for now, you can notice here, like this is just text and I didn't have to start it with a comment um, character because our markdown knows that anything in the white space is text. But if you do want to work with our code, you have to add a code chunk. And you can do this by actually typing this out. So you can, if you know where the back tick keys on your keyboard, which um, I'm, I don't know for any, not all of my keyboards, but if you do know where your back tick key is, you can type it out, but it's more convenient to go here to insert. Um, and then you click R and it will pop one of these code chunks in there for you. So anything that's written within the code chunk is going to work the exact same way as what we saw in the R script. So um, five plus five, like we had in the script, if we press command and enter on that, then we're going to get the output. But you notice that the output is actually showing up right beneath the code, which is kind of convenient. If I drop into this other, this other code block and do another operation, then it's going to put that output right underneath the code block. So you can see why this is kind of convenient. Um, and it's also very, like it's really great for reports because it's extremely reproducible. So you can keep note of what you're doing and then you can show your code and then the output is directly beneath it. So this is something that, you know, if you're working on a project, you can open a new R markdown file, keep track of why you're making the decisions that you're making as you go along and then have the code and output right next to each other. Also, I wanted to say that these very adorable um, images that we have throughout are all, all by Allison Horst, who has a whole GitHub repo of images, and she's active on Twitter, and she does a ton of really cute art um, drawings. So thanks to her for making those available. Okay, um, one more thing about code chunks before we go on. I told you already that you can click on the line and press command enter or control R, but you can also click on this little arrow. The main difference there is that if I have like two things going on in here, if I just click on a line and run it, um, it's only gonna output me that line that I was on. And if I press the arrow here, it's gonna run all lines in the code, uh, in the code chunk. And the other arrow here runs all code blocks above this one, but doesn't run this one. So if I close these, you can see if I click this one, it runs this code block, but doesn't run this one yet. This is kind of convenient if you um, need to kind of reset, like so you want to have like a clean slate when you get to this, this block. 
Okay, so um, that's the basics of our markdown and our studio. And we have a little exercise here that you can try out. You should add a code block below here, try out some different operations, try changing some different operations, and you can try and figure out what these symbols mean in R. Kyla, maybe you can take this. Um, yeah. There are a few errors coming up. Natasha has an error that says attempted uh, attempt to use um, zero length variable name. Sean has unexpected comma in 542 plus 345. Um, Abhimanyu also has an attempt to use zero length variable name. Okay. Yeah, so I'll show you, I'll start out by actually showing um, how I would do it. And maybe that, I hope that will get the questions, but please just like remind or post again if, if it doesn't get your question. So um, first, what you want to do here is you want to insert an R code block. And you can do that up, like you can do that by clicking insert and then pressing R. And if you're getting an error that says unexpected comma, then probably what you've done is maybe like try to put all of these on um, on one line. That's not going to work for R because the comma in R is a special character that lets it know that you're giving it um, different arguments in a function, or it has a specific function that's not exactly the same as kind of what you would imagine it to be if you were using text. So something like this is not going to um, work very well in R. But if you go ahead and delete the comma and drop this onto a new line, so if you delete both the commas and drop them onto new lines, then that um, should solve that problem for you. So I would drop them onto new lines. I'm adding some spaces here just so that it looks cleaner, but R is not very sensitive to spaces within a line. So for example, if you had a whole bunch of spaces here, this is still going to work. So if you click um, on the line and press Command Enter or Control R, then that line is still going to be read fine. So it's not sensitive to spaces within the lines or even between the lines, but it is sensitive to uh, how many things you have on one line. So you're going to have to stick with putting just like one operation on one line. Um, I'm not totally sure what the error, what's causing the error with the zero length variable name, but you can try having these um, written kind of like this and see if that persists. We shouldn't, we shouldn't be doing anything with variables, so I'm not totally sure. But in any case, this is um, how the syntax would work. And again, you can either click on the line and run the line, or you can click on this arrow here, and it's going to run all of the lines and output all of the answers, uh, each on their own line. OK, and this one, um, so I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to do insert R. Then I have an R code block here. And um, I can put this on one line and put this on another line. And if I run this line, you'll see what happens here is uh, two, two times 2 plus 12, which gives us 16. And what happens on this line is 12 plus 2, so 14 times 2 is 28. So you can see that R interprets parentheses in this context kind of in the same way that um, you may have seen in your high school math class. So you can also click the arrow to see both, both outputs at the same time. Now I'll show you this. This um, may be a little bit trickier, but so I'm asking, like, what is, what is this carrot? Um, character do. So say I do like 5 carrot 2, and I get the output that's 25. If I do 2 carrot 3, um, I get 8. So I, depending on how up to date your um, high school math might be, you will see that this is actually the expo exponent, <laughs> exponent operator. So this is 2 to the power of 3. This is 5 to the power of 2. Um, this is 10 to the power of 6, which writes out in um, scientific notation. So it, all it's saying is like 1 plus 6 zeros. OK, so the caret operator is the exponent operator. And these two um, percentage signs, this is one that I'll be surprised if 
Um, a lot of people got this right, and, unless you maybe have a little bit of programming experience, because something I definitely didn't come into contact with until I started getting into coding. And so when you do that, you can see like, okay, 12, this, um, this symbol five leaves us with two, um, 10, this symbol three is gonna give us, um, oops, is gonna give us one. And what that is actually called is the modulo, I think that's how you say it, modulo, modulo operator. And it will divide this number by this number and it will give you what's the remainder. So 12 divided by five is two with two left over or the remainder two. So it gives us two and 10 remainder three, uh, modulo three gives us one because there's one left over. This might not seem very useful, but it can be used as a test if something is even or odd. So if you do 12 modulo two, you're gonna get zero because 12 is even. But if you do 11 modulo two, you're gonna get one because it's odd. Okay, but that was just kind of a little um, exercise to try out some different code. Are we all doing okay now in terms of um, following along with the exercises? Yeah, Kyla, maybe you could um, just quickly show where the console is has gone and just oh. again show that you're working in the markdown because I think that the problem with the, uh, what was it, zero length variable name is because people are trying to copy paste code chunks into the console and then it doesn't work. Oh. So maybe you could just quickly show. Oh, right. Okay, good uh, point. Yeah. On. No, yeah, that's a really good point. So you can see before I showed you like the script and the console, when you're working with an R script, you have to have the console visible because otherwise you won't see what's happening. But when you're working in an R markdown, you don't need to see the console. So what I've actually done, also so that you can see it better on the Zoom screen here, is I've minimized the console. So this is, the console is um, still quietly like in the background doing what's in the code here. And you can leave this open if it doesn't bother you. Like there's no reason not to leave it open. But um, when you're working in the R markdown, the console output is already shown in line. So you don't need to use the console and you can um, minimize it. Also the fact with the code block, this is a convention that you need only in R markdown. So if you did work in the console, you actually don't need to put that, um, like these three back ticks in the R that, that won't be um, understood by the console. So if you're working in the console, which you can do, it will just put output here. But um, when you're working in this R markdown, like for the exercises going on, just go ahead and put like a code block in here and get the output. You can press this little minimize button here to get the console out of the way because um, we won't need it. Like the output will be shown here in the R markdown. Yeah, good point. Okay, any other questions before we talk about um, variables in R? Again, this is just a nice little picture that shows um, all the support that you get when you're learning a language from friends and teachers and community. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Uh, so Natasha did figure it out. The problem was she was clicking on run instead of run this chunk. So maybe you want to um, get into okay. that a bit as well. Mm -hmm. Good point. Okay. So when you, um, yeah, when you work with a code chunk in R Markdown, the easiest thing to do here is to click on this little arrow. This run button is going to try to run like lines or chunks or maybe all of the lines in the whole document, maybe something like way down in the markdown that we haven't even seen yet is like throwing an error because it's, it's empty or something like that. So I wouldn't really use this run button up here for our markdown just because like these code blocks are so convenient. So really what I would do is um, every time we're working like from now on in this markdown is just put the code inside one of these blocks and then you can just run it by clicking on the arrow. Yeah, but good point. Thanks for um, pointing that out, Natasha. Okay, so then we'll go on to the next big thing about um, the R language. And that is working with variables. So variables um, give a name or kind of like a label to a particular part of output. And this allows you to use this output later on in the script um, for like more complicated um, steps or just to keep 
kind of to just to save this output and keep it for later. And you can give your variable any sort of name, but there's a couple of things that it can't have. So it can't have spaces in it. It has to be just one word. You can use underscores to kind of simulate spaces if that kind of helps your variable name be more clear. Um, you can use capital letters or lowercase letters, but you will have to call them in the same way. I'll show you both of these things in just a second. So um, what's quite common is to use this, which is called um, snake case, where you just have your words in lowercase with a underscore in between. And so you give a name to your variable, and then you use this arrow, which points to the left, and then you have code. So for example, say I want to have a variable called num cats, which stands for number of cats. So I call it num underscore cats, and then I use this arrow, which I'm going to call the assignment operator because it assigns a value to a variable. So you use the assignment operator, and then I'm doing 12. So I want number of cats to be 12. Now, if I run this line, I'm going to click on it and press um, Command Enter, but you can also press Control R. And you can see that this automatically pops something up in my environment tab. So now R says, OK, within the environment of this R markdown document, we know that you have this thing called numcats, which should have the value 12. So now when I want to use um, numcats in the future, so say I want to triple the number of cats that I have in, in my life, I can do um, numcats times three. And when I run that line, it will print out 36. So you can see that R has remembered that um, numcats is 12 and 12 times three is 36. And this, so a variable also exists um, outside of just this block, it will exist in this entire document. So if I open like a new code block and I call numcats, and you can click on this arrow, and you can see that like it still remembers that it's 12. So it doesn't have to be in the same block. It will be the value of 12 for this whole document. Now, like I was saying a second ago, um, if I tried this with like number of cats with spaces in it, and then I tried to assign it to 12, going to tell me that there's like an unexpected symbol. And what that means is just that it doesn't know what to do with something with spaces in it. So if you fill those with underscores, then that is going to work. Um, if I then later call number of cats with a capital N, <laughs> see, look, um, our, our studio is telling me mm, that doesn't sound like a variable that you already have. But if I try to run that, it's not going to find it because the it's case sensitive. So here, if you have um, no capitals, then here can't have any capitals. OK, so you can try to click on this arrow to run this block. And then we can go down to this um, block here. And so I have a new variable here called num dogs. And that's seven because I, I like cats a little bit better than dogs. So I have num dogs is seven. And you can see that also pops up here in our environment. So I have now this third one because I used it as an example, but you should have num cats and num dogs. And so now I have num cats and num dogs, and I can actually make a new variable using two existing variables. So if I want to have number of pets, maybe I want to add like the number of cats I have and the number of dogs. So I can do num pets is equal to or assigned um, num cats plus num dogs. So you'll see that that um, numpets now shows up in the environment tab as being equal to 19. And if I call just numpets in its own block, you'll see that it also remembers that that's 19. So you'll notice here that um, here I called numcats times three, but all I'm doing there is showing the output of what numcats times three would be. I'm not actually changing um, the numcats variable. So numcats is still remembered to be 12. And here's just another example. So say I do want to like update the number of cats um, in there in my variable, then I can assign it to a new variable, like double cats, and that's going to remember that it's um, 24. So the point being that you can use variables to assign new variables. 
Okay, so now we have another little example. It's an example um, about a pizza party. So you have uh, variables about guests and the amount of pizza you have, the amount of slices it has. And so go ahead and do that and make sure when you do that, you um, go here to insert R and then you pop like a little R block. And you can actually do that under all of the questions and put a little R block under there. And then you can work with each, like you can directly answer the question in the block below. So here you can start out with making your guest variable and then here you can make your pizza variable and so on. When would you use a C before assigning to a figure instead of just writing the number? Yeah, I can explain. Um, sometimes you need to use like, for example, if you put guests and then you put an error and then you put a C and um, 15, for example. Mm -hmm. and, and sometimes it, it's, it's just 15. So I don't really get when to use the C and when not. Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, so for these ones, these like what we're working with here are simple variables. And you can see that like every time that I'm assigning something to it, I'm, I'm assigning um, what ends up being just one value. So here it's like the number 12. This, it looks like it's more than one, but you know that first it's gonna add these numbers together and then it's gonna take that number and assign it to um, num pets. So that's, that means that for none of these questions, you have to do anything with like a C syntax. And when you're working with a C syntax, you're actually working with a vector. And I'm going to talk about vectors actually in the next section. So I think that will um, probably help clear that up because I know that's a question that comes up a lot when you're getting started with R. So yeah, thanks. I um, Just let me know if after the next section, it's still unclear to you. Thanks okay, a lot. Think, yeah, no problem. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to show you how I would do this section. And please um, let us know if you have any problems with it. So the first question, we're trying to make a variable called guests. So I'm going to say guests and assign that to um, 15. And you want to order five pizzas. Um, so I'm going to make something called pizzas, a variable and assign it to six. And then it says each pizza has 12 slices, assign the variable slices to the amount of slices you have over all pizzas. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna have slices is equal to pizzas times, how many slices per pizza do we have? 12, okay, so this is more of an American style pizza than um, maybe a European style pizza, a big one basically. Okay, so you see now I've got this set up, um, but I have to run it. So I have to first, like, I have guests 15. I have to make sure I run that because otherwise, um, like, the variable guest is not going to show up in the environment because all you've done is type it, but you haven't, like, committed that code to your current R environment or your current R situation. So make sure you run that. And the same happens here. So say like I have pizza six and slices this pizza times six. If I go ahead and run this without um, making the pizza variable first, it's going to tell me that it can't find pizzas. And if you look over here in the environment, you can confirm that it can't find pizzas because it doesn't exist yet. So you have to make sure you run this pizzas line first, so that you have pizzas up here. And then you can run slices and you'll see that it does the math for me there and does um, pizzas times 12. Then to find out how many people, um, how many slices each person can have, that's not something that we have to assign to a variable. It's just something that we want to see what the answer is. So I'm just going to do slices divided by guests and click on this arrow. And you'll see that that just gives me the output. We don't really need to like save that to a variable because that's not something we're going to use again. It's just something that we want to know the answer to. Okay, and five more people arrive to the party uninvited, update your guests variable to the total number you have now. How many slices can each person have now? And you can do this in two ways. You could either say, okay, I'm gonna go back up here and I'm gonna make this be 20 and then I'm gonna run that. And then I'm gonna come back down here and do um, slices divided by guests. Or say you kept this at 15, let's run it. Then you could come down here and say like guests, you can either do it down here, guest is 20, in which case it will then update your guests. 
or you can do guests equals guests plus five. So say you forgot how many were there originally, you can just do like guests is guests plus five, and then you'll still get the same answer there. Um, this little comic shows uh, something that happens very often, which is that you might end up doing something like slice divided by guests. And you're like, what? How come I can't find slice? I just made slice. What's up? Okay. But most of the time, it's just that you maybe misspelled your variable. So this is a common um, thing that might happen to you with R. Yeah, are there any questions before I move on to vectors? Okay. So vectors, this is what um, we just had the question about, which is what's up with the C in R? And this is something that comes up a lot because quite often you'll have, you'll see this little like C in front of uh, parentheses. And what this is, is this is something called a vector. And a vector is multiple items of the same type. And so um, not necessarily like a programming equivalent, but a real life equivalent would be like a list, like a grocery list where you have multiple things that you've written into it. But you want to still call this one thing, which is a list, but you know that there's actually multiple things within that list. So say I wanted to like keep all my favorite numbers in, in an array or in one variable, then I would um, do this as a vector. And for that, I would call this C and then parentheses. And then you list things inside with a comma. So um, yeah, so here I have my numbers and I do C parentheses, no, first number, comma, second number, comma, third number, comma, fourth. And you can make this as long as you want. You can put as many numbers in it as you want. So when I run that, I'll have to make sure I run that line or run both lines with this um, arrow. Then I now have a value um, in my environment called my numbers. And it gives you a little bit of information here. It tells you my numbers contains items of the type numeric. So there's numbers in there. There are six, so there's items from one to six. And it shows a little preview of the first numbers. Um, you can also drag this out if you want like a bigger preview, but I don't really want a bigger one right now. And one thing you can do with a vector is you can call length on it, which will tell you how many things are inside of the vector. So you can't call length on like a simple variable, but you can call it on a vector. And when you start to have a vector, you can do kind of cool things with it, um, like vector-wise operations. So um, for example, if I call my numbers plus two, I don't know, if you think about this for a minute, you, you might wonder, okay, what is this actually going to do? You know, is it gonna add a two in there? What's it gonna do? But if we call my vectors plus two, we see that what it's done is it's actually taken every number that's in here and it's added two to it and it's, um, output those numbers. So 12 plus 2 is 14, 14 plus 2 is 16, um, 26 plus 2 is 28, and so on. But my vectors, uh, sorry, my number stays the same, so we're just looking at it. We can also take it to the second power, which will return like all of the um, numbers squared. We can divide each one by 10, it will divide each one by 10. And this in um, programming lingo is called broadcasting. So it will take this operation and broadcast it to everything that's inside of um, our vector. And now a little bit fancy, what you can do is you can also add two vectors together. So here we're adding the my numbers vector to itself. So to my numbers plus my numbers. And what that's actually going to do is it's going to take each item and add it to itself. So remember that my numbers um, is 12, 14, 26. So 12 plus 12 is 24, 14 plus 14 is 28 and so on. Um, yeah, so that it actually matches up the, the items. And then when it, when it runs out of items, it, start, it would start again. So that's another thing that you can do with vectors that you can't do with just like a simple, um, a simple variable or that would look a little bit different. And the final thing I'll show you is the bracketing. So you can take square brackets and you put in there like the number of the item that you want to get out. And when you run this line, it will retrieve that item for you. So number one is 12. Um, the fourth item that we had in our vector was 57. Yeah, so whenever you see the C, the C syntax in 
R, you're working with a vector. So it has multiple things in it. Um, so I have a couple of questions here that you can try it out. Again, make sure that you add the code blocks and um, then try making like a long array and a short array and subtracting them from each other. While we are waiting, um, could you briefly again explain that you're working in Markdown? There seemed to be um, some confusion about that, just that it's a Markdown file, how it's different from a regular script, um, what the codes and the chunks mean, just a brief um, mm -hmm. yeah. thing for people who yeah, missed sure. the first 10 minutes. Yeah, sure. So um, our Markdown and our script are two fundamentally different ways of working with R. They have some similarity, so they both run R code, but they do it in a slightly different way. So if you're working with an R script, so if you have an R script open right now, then you won't have anything to do with um, R codes because, or R chunks, because um, R scripts interpret everything that's in them as R code. So, yes, here we go. So when you have an R script open, then everything in it is in, code and you just put code in there. You can put comments in. You have to start with the hashtag and that will show in the console. And it won't show anything in the R script besides the code. So that's um, one way that you can work with R. That's what I showed at the very beginning, which was like, it's a, it will be a file that just looks totally empty. And if I start to like type in here, um, it's going to com complain at me that I'm not typing an R code. So I have to work in R code if I'm in an, an R script besides comments. And if you're working with an R markdown file, which is what this file is that uh, I currently have open and it's what the file is that we sent around, then um, everything that you just type plain into an R markdown file, I'll open up um, a new one for you. So an R markdown file always has text and then code has to come inside of chunks. So when I'm showing everything I'm showing you here is in an R markdown file, which is why I have like um, I'm able to do like instructions in plain you know English text. But if I just type some code in here, um, it's not a good idea. You want to go ahead and put a code block in there. Um, I'm not sure if that clears up the confusion about it. I, it's something it might take a little bit of getting used to. But if you stick with me by trying to follow along in this file in the R markdown file, I think that will be easiest. If you you can try and translate it to an R script, but things will be a little little bit different. Primarily that if you're working only in R script, you want to only put code in there with no blocks and just and no text, just the code. Natasha has an error as well in long array, short array, a non numeric argument to binary operator. Okay, so let me go ahead and make long and short array on my version just so that we can see and just check if everything looks kind of the same to you. Um, like pretty much, it should look, it will have to look pretty much identical to what I'm typing. So if I have this long array, I can copy paste this in here. You got to start with this C and then the parentheses, and then you can put everything um, in there and make sure that you run it. So make sure you click on this arrow and you can double check that you've done that by making sure that it shows up here in your environment panel. So here you can see that I have long array in there. So it's worked for me. Then I'm going to drop down here and I'm going to just do this in its own code block. Again, that's insert R because I want to insert some R code into this document. And I'm going to call this one short array. And so I start again with the C. And then I have um, these numbers to go in it. So now I've right, ran this block by clicking on the arrow. And so now I want to do long array versus short array. So here I will do short array, or actually I want to do long array minus short array. Doesn't really matter which way you do it because um, we'll do it the opposite way in this next question. And then if I run that, um, you'll see what it's doing. So first I'll tell you what, what it's doing here and then I'll address what might be happening if you are getting like an error like that. 
So here we have long array minus short array, and you can see that it starts with this one. So one, one, two, two, five, ten, and it's going to subtract. So these ones kind of in a loop. So it's going to do one minus one, one minus six, two minus ten, and then it runs out of items. So it just starts again from the beginning. Two minus one, five minus six, and ten minus ten. Um, I'm going to compare that by showing you this other one. And then I will tell you what I think might be happening if you're getting that error. So say you have here short array minus long array. Then you're going to start with this one. So 1 minus 1, 6 minus 1, 10 minus 2. And then this one, again, runs out of items. So it just starts over again. So then it does 1 minus 2, 6 minus 5, and 10 minus 10. So that um, shows you a little bit of how R matches up arrays if they're of different lengths, or sorry, vectors. I'm kind of using the terms a little bit interchangeably. Now, if you're getting this error about non-binary non operator assigned um, to a numeric, something like that, the, the one that numeric you just- argument to binary operator. Exactly, yeah, okay. Then probably what's happening there, or what that sounds like it's telling you is that your um, array or your vector doesn't have numbers in it. So for example, say like I put these in parentheses, um, put these in like, quotation marks, then R is going to think that this is um, a whole bunch of text and it's not numbers. And then when I try to add or subtract things from it, it's going to get confused because it doesn't know that you're working with numbers. And that's exactly what the next part of this tutorial will cover. So I'll um, ask you just to hang in there for a second and I'll tell you a little bit more about the data types, but that does sound like it's what's happening there. So you can see like my arrays here um, they say num because it, it knows that there's numbers in there. And if you say something different there, then you probably have a different data type, which is what we're about to um, go into. Yeah, so um, we can continue on to data types unless there's more questions about vectors. So the, qu the quotation marks solved it, but mm -hmm. oh, well, now she said, never mind. Um, but the next error was longer object length is not a multiple of shorter object length. Um, mm -hmm. So that's actually just a warning. I don't think it's an error. Um, and that is probably happening because you've forgotten one of these elements somewhere. So like if I have only five in my long array and then I subtract from it um, the short array, it warns me that it's not a multiple, that it's not the same length, but it still gives me the output here. So um, all that means is like, it's trying to tell you, okay, be careful because you might not know what's going on because you're taking like six things or five things and you're subtracting three, which means that, you know, here we go one, two, three, we're out of items. So we start at the beginning, one, two. Okay, but then this 10 was only used once. So it doesn't totally make sense that it lines up. But um, yeah, so I think the reason that you would get that is if you either forgot one in your long array or you forgot one in your um, short array. Okay, so now I'll tell you a bit about data types, which will explain the problem with the quotation marks a bit. So data types is um, how R interprets the input that you give it. So when you um, give R something, it, it tries to guess what kind of data that you're giving it. Um, you've seen before, like everything we've worked with so far, we've been assigning numbers to variables and we've been working with numbers. And numbers are represented in R as a type called numeric. And you can see this if you use the command class. So class is a command um, where you have like the, the name of the operation of the function outside of the parentheses. And then you have what you want it to take the class of inside of the parentheses. So for example, like let's look at this one, um, class of 8.8. .8. So it's telling you that 8.8 .8 is interpreted by R as numeric, which is right because it's a number. And any type of number will come back as numeric um, on the first round. So I think even like two will come back as numeric. And you can even see this within a variable. So variables also have like data types. So if, you, if we go back um, to making a variable called favorite number and we call it, and we assign it to the number 12, then if we call class on the favorite number, we 
we learn that what's stored inside of that variable is numeric. Okay, so numeric is basically numbers. There's also um, a slightly more um, specialized data type called integer. Again, something that might ring a bell from your math classes of the past. Um, integer is a whole number with no ver ver <laughs> decimals, no decimals. So um, here I show you how to take 8.8, .8, which we know is a number, and actually interpret it as an integer. So if we do as integer, which is again um, a command, so you do as dot integer, and then inside of the parentheses is the thing that you want to convert to an integer. So if we run this, you'll see that if we tell R, okay, take this 8.8, .8, but you have to understand it as an integer, then it will take it as an eight. So it's not like a rounding feature. It just like looks at, okay, what's the actual number here? So say we have like a variable and we assign it to 8.8, .8, but, we, but we're telling it this has to be an integer. You can't, like I'm not allowing you to um, understand this as a number that includes decimals. You have to understand it as an integer. So then when I assign that, when we come back here and call integer variable, you'll see that it only has eight in it. So it said, okay, if I have to, R is basically telling you, if I have to understand this thing as an integer, then I'm gonna have to get rid of this decimal stuff and just keep the eight, okay? And um, you can prove this by when you call class on integer variable, it tells you it's, it's an integer. It's not, it's not a number like this one was. And I'm showing you also the syntax of as.integer because it's pretty standard over different data types that if you want to change it to a different um, data type than what was originally interpreted, you do like as dot and then give it the data type that you want um, it to understand that thing as. Yeah, so in, a, in addition to these numeric and integer data types, we have um, the character data type. And the character data type is always enclosed in quotation marks, which is um, why you might have gotten an error earlier. So if something is enclosed in quotation marks, it's always interpreted. <laughs> it's always, well, it's most always interpreted as a character. So for example, if we call a class on um, hello, then that will tell us that it, that's going to be interpreted as a character. And if we call a class on hello with no quotation marks. Um, it's going to complain about that. And the reason for that, you can think back to think back to when we did variables, is it's going to look for the variable called hello. Because remember, like here, when we're calling just text, what we mean by that is for R to like look in its environment for the thing that has the same label. So it's going to tell you, no, we don't find any variable called hello. Um, so that's part of the reason why you have to enclose it in quotation marks. And these will also work as um, single quotation marks, as long as like they're the same one on both, on both sides. Okay, so let's say we have this um, my word variable and we wanna assign it to a character string called hello. So we can do that. We can do my word is hello. And if you look again in the environment tab, then you'll see it there. So my word is hello. You can see it, it includes the little quotes to show you that it's a character. And if we call a class, it will tell us it's a character. Now this will produce an error, which is why I put a, um, a hashtag in front of it, because like I told you at the beginning, putting a hashtag in front of something makes R like ignore that line. So I didn't want it to like print the error. So I put that there. But if you delete that and try and run this, you're going to get exactly that um, the error that we saw earlier, right? So, or that we talked about earlier, non-numeric argument to binary operator. And so in this context, I think it, it should make sense why this is not something that R can do. So R does not know how to take hello and add two to it because hello is not a number, right? It's a, it's a word. So that's the kind of thing that you'll get if you, um, if you try and do like math operations with something that is not a number. Yeah, and here again, this is where I'm just showing you, if I forget the quotes, um, then it's going to look for something called Kyla in the environment, it's not going to find it. But if I put it in quotes, it has no problem there. Oh, yeah, this is nice. Um, will you shut up, man? 
Okay, so um, another specialized data type is the logical, and the logical is either true or false and nothing else. So this kind of a data type is what you get if you're testing um, if things are equal to each other, if things are not equal to each other, if things are greater or less than or greater than or equal to something. So I'll show you, for example, seven is less than eight. That's going to return true because um, seven is less than eight. And you can also do like seven equals eight. And this is something that people question all the time is like, why do you need two equal signs here? Like, why can't you just do seven equals eight? And the reason you need two is because here you're actually showing that you want to test if it's equal to each other. So you're not trying to say seven is eight, you're just trying to test if seven is equal to eight. So that will, for example, return false. Um, you can also do this with characters. So dog is not the same as dogs. You can do greater than or equal to. Um, if you try and do like characters are equal to numbers, it's just gonna tell you, no, that's not true. Like the word seven is not e the same as the number seven. And you can see that if we like wrap something like that in a class call, it will tell us it's logical. Um, here's Bernie Sanders reminding us to use the double equals. Okay, and the final thing um, is one of the more complicated data types of R. So I'm just going to like touch on it briefly, but just know that this is something that will come up again and again. So I just want to like introduce it to you, but I'm not trying to um, say that you're definitely going to totally understand everything about factors right away, but I hope that this will help. So factors are similar to characters in that they deal with text but they're different to characters in that they deal with levels or like groupings. So if there's bins or categories that each row belongs to one of the categories, then this is a, like a candidate for being turned into a factor. Okay, so let me show you a practical example. Say I ask like um, 10 or 12 people here what their favorite flavor of ice cream is. Then I can have a vector called favorite flavors this is a character vector. So before we made one with numbers, but this one I'm using text. So I want to use the, the quotation marks because I want it to be full of um, text. So I write down what everyone's favorite flavor is. Okay, so we have to run this line to make sure that this um, variable shows up in our environment. And we can look at it. So it says, okay, we took the favorite flavors vector and we interpret that as character. And now I'm gonna show you this call called summary, which will give you some information about um, about vectors or data frames. So let's just call it and see what it gives us. So it says, okay, there's 10 things inside of this vector and it's of class or data type character. Okay, that's kind of useful, but not super useful. Um, but let's, let's try changing this vector into a factor. So we wanna tell R that these are actually groups. This is not like random text, but these are groups that repeat. So we'll do favorite flavors is equal to or assigned to um, as factor favorite flavors. This is the way that you change the data type of a existing variable. So favorite flavors, let's, let's take this guy, which is interpreted as a character and let's force it into factor and let's call it that. And you can see that over here in your environment, this is already updated in a way that's kind of helpful. So it will say now that it's a factor with four levels. And what that means is that it's a grouping that has four different different options. So let's see here. Um, we can see now that it tells us it's a, it's a factor. And if we call summary, it will actually tell us, okay, there's these four categories, chocolate, mint, cho chocolate chip, no, chocolate, mint, chocolate chip, strawberry, and vanilla. And chocolate has four, mint, chocolate chip has one, strawberry has three, and vanilla has two. And one more thing you can do with factors that you can't do with other data types is look at the levels. And levels is just going to tell you what the potential options, potential groupings are within that um, factor vector. So this might seem a little bit abstract now, but um, you can probably imagine that this is useful when you're dealing with data frames because data frames, if you have, say you're doing an experiment and you're just writing down what country someone comes from, and they're all either from you know, Germany or Austria. So you only have two options. 
you can see how that might be like a little bit more of an intuitive way to have our work with that data. Okay, so I have a couple of exercises again. Um, go ahead and try them out. Make sure you add the code blocks. And yeah, let us know if there's any questions. <laughs> so I'll show you here. And I'm going to go ahead and insert the code blocks again. So my name, which I briefly actually showed this before. So this is my name, which is Kyla. And if I call class on my name, and I can answer the second question of what data type is the variable. And then here I'm showing you just two commands that you can use on character variables or character type items um, in R just kind of for fun. So like there's ncare. If I call ncare on my name, uh, it returns four because my name has four letters. And similarly, you can use two upper on my name. And it's just going to change the string into all capital letters. Then in the next question, we work with um, logicals. So if you do my n care of my name is greater than or equal to four, then it's going to assess that statement and tell me that it's true because my name is equal to four um, character length. I pulled a bonus question here about um, what about about true equals one and false equals one and try them with zero. That just um, shows you that that our underlies like underlying logicals is actually like a binary zero one system. So you can play around with that if you want. But um, this is kind of the main the main part of understanding the variables. Yeah. So are there any questions on what we've just covered? Otherwise, I'm going to hand it over to um, Julia and we're going to talk to you a little bit more about packages. Okay, I don't see any questions at the moment. Feel free to just put them in the chat and we'll get to them. Um, yeah, so in that case, I think um, I'll take over and share my screen. Okay. Okay, so you should now see my R studio. Okay, and this is just where we left off. So we'll talk about um, packages now. So as you've seen, um, R comes with um, a lot of commands already installed and ready to use for you. So things like um, the number of characters or length or as factor, things like that. Everything that Kyla has showed you, that was that's already um, implemented in R and you can just use that. But very often you want additional commands, um, so uh, more specialized commands. So for example, um, if you have um, geographical data, there are packages that can deal with uh, geographical data and can let you draw maps. Um, or if you have uh, text data, there are packages that let you analyze text better. Um, and so these are basically add-ons that you can download and use, and they give you um, a bunch more commands uh, to play around with. Um, yeah, and the nice thing, as Kyla mentioned about R and, and the community is that everybody can contribute to that. And it's a really open um, and welcoming and friendly community. Okay, so how do we get these packages? Um, what we'll do first is we'll have to install them. So the way this works is that you type in install packages and then open brackets and you type in the package name in quotation marks. So, um, Let's all do that with uh, this command. So install packages and then in brackets um, and quotation marks tidyverse, right? So you can put that either in the console down here, right? I'm not going to do it because I already have it installed. But if you um, if you just downloaded R recently, um, you probably don't have it yet. So just copy paste that into the console and just hit enter and let that run. So that's going to install the packages or tidyverse for you and that's a package we'll use today and then also every every time every time we use r um, we'll probably use that package so that's how you can install packages there's also an option here on the right where it says packages and then you can click on install and type in oops type in the name of the package and then click on install that's another option. So they both do the same thing. Okay. 
right. So once you have that installed, you also need to load the package. So that's what we're doing with this command here. So that's the library command, right? So library and then in brackets, tidyverse. That's the package we just installed with this command. And now we want to actually get, get it ready to use. So we're going to run that. Okay. And actually um, in Windows, if you want to run um, a line in Markdown, it's Control Enter, right? So I'm just my cursor is here. I'm I've clicked on this line, and then if I do if I do Control Enter, it'll run that line. Okay. So if you want to add a package to your to your R um, environment, you if you use it for the first time, if you haven't used it before, you need to um, install it first, right? So you need this install packages command. And you only need to do that one time. But whenever you start a new R session, so let's say I close this and um, get some dinner, go to sleep and then come back tomorrow and I reopen my R studio and I want to use this library again uh, or this package again, I need to run this code again. So I need to load it every time I come back to R and I start a new R session. So the people, everybody has a different metaphor to help you remember that. Uh, the one I like is that, if you move into a new flat um, or a new house, uh, you probably need to install light bulbs in every room, right? So you need to go from room to room, um, screw in some light bulbs, um, but you only need to do that once, hopefully, unless they break. Uh, so that's like um, installing a package, but then every time you walk into a room and you want to switch on the light, you need to hit the light switch. So that's like loading the package, which is what we're doing here. Okay, so maybe that helps you remember that. Nothing will break usually if you install packages several times, but it's just a waste of time. You don't need to do that um, all the time. So um, did that work for everyone? Could you all run the install packages command for tidyverse and then this command library tidyverse or are there any issues? Okay. Looks good, great. Um, yeah, so let's let's try something. Let me show you what happens if I try this command. So beep and then in brackets two. Okay, so it's giving me an error. It says could not find function beep. And that's the error. So could not find a function. That's the error you get if you don't have the, a package installed or loaded, right? So something's missing here. So what we need to do um, is install the package and then load the package, right? So I need to do install packages. Yeah, and you can see that RStudio already kind of auto completes this to help me out. Um, and then in quotation marks, beep R, right? That's the package that this um, command or function is from. So I need to install that. I have already installed that, so I'm not going to run that but I need to load it, right? So I need to do, I need to run that command and then now it works and you, you can't hear that I think, but it, this is just a library that plays sound. So you can play around with the numbers and you get different uh, sounds, right? And this is something that is, um, yeah, nice and entertaining, but also useful if you run code that takes a long time to run and you have RStudio in the background and then it'll play um, a tone for you, a little sound for you um, when you're done. Okay, so as a little um, exercise, um, can you all please install the cow say package? So that's the name of the package, cow say, right? So install that and load that. And then you can try this command. Okay, so you would have to do install packages and then cows, oops, cow say, right? So that's to install it. Again, I'm not running it because I already have it. But what I do need to run is library cow say, there you go. And then if you run this, you'll get a little chicken, which tells you good luck learning R. <laughs> I 
And you can play around with this. Instead of having a chicken, you can have a cat that, tell, that wishes you good luck. Or you can also have, you can put in any code or any text, I should say, that you like and have the cat, uh, the cat tell it to you. So that's that's what the cow say package allows you to do. Maybe not very useful, but definitely very cute. Okay. All right, so let's actually get to reading in some data. So most of the time uh, you will have some data that, that you want to read into R, that you want to visualize, analyze, um, and so on, reformat and whatever you want to do, right? So in order um, to do that, you need to know where the data is saved, so where the file is saved, and what kind of a file you're working with. So if you downloaded all the materials, it should look like this. So this is the entire folder. We're in this markdown file. We have a file that's called jump.csv and we have some penguin data, which we'll get to in a minute. So if I open the jump.csv just in a um, text editor, just to see what this looks like, Right, I can see that we have um, a header, so it says participant height centimeter and jump height. So these we have three variables in here. One is the participant. Uh, the next one is how tall are they in centimeters, and the third one is how high can they jump. So we can see participant A is uh, 170 centimeters and jumped 51 centimeters high. So that's our little data file and you should all have that. It's all just in the folder. And you can see that this is saved. So this is saved in the same folder as our markdown, right? So this is the markdown and the jump CSV is in, a, uh, in the same folder, in the same location on your computer, right? So at, when we open it, we saw that the different values here, they are separated from each other by commas. So this is a comma separated file, right? And that's important to know. So we need to know that to read it into R correctly. So let's go ahead. Um, <laughs> so let's go ahead and do that. And there are two, or there are many more, more ways of doing it. The one that we'll go with is with the read underscore CSV command, right? So read underscore CSV. And then in the brackets, I'm putting in the file name in quotation marks, right? And it's important here that this needs to include the file extension. So this .csv, that needs, also, that needs to be there, right? So you need to have that. So that's the command to read it in. And we're telling R, please assign this to jump data, right? So it's like we're creating a variable. Now we're just creating um, a data frame and the data frame will contain this data that we just saw. Okay, so if we execute that, we get a little, this is nothing to worry about. It just tells us how it was read in. And now you can see that I have jump data here in my environment, right? So here you can see that. So we have this read underscore CSV command and that assumes that um, we're using commas to separate the different um, values. Right. Um, another option that gives us the same result is to use read underscore delim. And then again, we're typing in the file name and then a comma. And then we need to tell, we need to tell R explicitly what the separator is. So how the different columns are separated from each other. So we type in delim equals, and then in quotation marks, comma, right, to tell R we're using a comma to separate. So if I run that, yeah, nothing changes. I'm just overwriting the, the old data um, file, but that works too. So we have read CSV and read delim. There are some situations um, where you need read underscore CSV2. So if the separator in, in the CSV is uh, a semicolon, that's when you need read CSV2. Right, or alternatively, you could use uh, read delim and specify the semicolon as the delimiter, right, as the separator. So you need to know what the file looks like before you read it in, in order to read it in um, correctly. Okay, 
And what we also have is, um, is a command called read underscore TSV, right? And that's for tab separated um, files, right? So that would be, that would usually be a, a text file. And we'll see an example of that later. And um, where you have tabs instead of um, commas or semicolons. Okay, and we'll have examples of these three types later on. Um, okay, so what I showed you with, um, so just using, just using the file name, just typing in the file name, this works because we're in an R markdown and our markdown sets what's called the working directory. It sets it to where this markdown file is saved. So what that means is that, that when we give it a command like this, it'll, start, it'll search for this file, a file that's called that, in the same folder, right? In the same location, so here. The markdown is here and the CSV is saved in the same location. So it's, it's looking for it in the same location, right? So the working directory is this folder right now. So that's another reason why markdowns are really useful. If you're using a script, um, you can set the working directory with the set um, wd command, right? So set working directory. Um, this is for Mac. So this is how you have to kind of type it in when you have a Mac. And this is for um, Windows. So you would have to kind of copy paste the path here. So for me, um, this would be the path, right? If I wanted to do that. I would have to type in something like that, right? If I was working in a script or if I was working in the console, I would have to do that. Um, or you can also copy paste the entire path. Um, that should also work, right? But the easiest way really is to work in a markdown and then just make sure that you have your, um, make sure that you have your file saved in the same location. Okay, so now we have a little data file read in. So let's actually look at that and see what that looks like. So yeah, I already mentioned that it now turns up in our environment at the top. So you can click on this little arrow and then it'll show you the variables that are part of the data. So participant, height, centimeter and jump height, just as we saw when we just opened it. So participant is character. So it shows you the data types just like it would if you did class, if you ran class on one of these. Um, height centimeter and, and jump height are both numeric, right? Shows you that. And you can also click on, so here I'm clicking on jump underscore data and it's opening it in a new little tab at the top here. And it's showing as a preview, right? So it's always a good idea when you read in some data Always make sure that it turns up here on the top right, that it's added to your environment and make sure that it has what looks like a good number of variables. So eight observations um, means eight rows and then three variables, three columns basically. So make sure that that's correct. If that's not correct, um, that means that something went wrong here. So maybe it's a different separator. Maybe you have to use CSV2 instead of CSV. And I'll show you examples in a second as well. Okay, so a couple more things we can do with the data is command on it. So head and then jump data in the brackets. And that just shows us the, us the first six rows, right? Um, so the first, yeah, first six people. We can also change that so that it shows us six um, rows is the default, but we can change that if we want. We just need to add n equals and then a number. So here I'm doing n equals three. And now we're seeing the first three rows. Okay, and I could change that to um, four. We'd see the first rows, okay? So we can see that this head command has an argument, which data are we looking at? So if you have several different um, data frames here, which one are we actually working with? And then this n argument number, so how many rows, is another argument and you can change that um, to whatever number you like. Uh, okay, are there any questions so far? Okay, all right. Um, another really useful um, command is summary. 
right? So if you use that for an entire data frame, so here we have summary and then in brackets, jump data, I'll just run that. It shows you some information on all the different variables in your data frame. So you have participant, which is um, a character. So it just tells us there are um, eight, yeah, eight participants in here. And then for the numeric variables, it shows us something like the minimum. So the smallest person is 159 centimeters. The tallest is 182. Um, it shows us the mean, so the average. It shows us the median. So the median splits the data at 50%. Um, and then the first uh, quartile splits the data at 25 and the third quartile at 75% of the data. So for the third uh, quartile, that means that 75% um, of the data is below 171, right? Um, so that's useful um, information. Okay. So now, and yeah, I'll also go, I'll show this first part because that's often a bit tricky. Um, and then I'll give you a minute to do the other exercises. So in our folder, we have these three penguin data files. So the first one, so you can see penguin data underscore one dot CSV. So what does, what does that actually look like? Let's open it. Okay, and we can see we have um, a lot more data than in, in our little jump data file. So this is a data set on some penguins and uh, on which island do they live and um, some measurements. Um, yeah, and which year um, that measurement was recorded. So we can again see that we have commas that separate um, the different variables. So we should be able to read this in. So I'm just going to call this penguin one or penguin, yeah, penguins one. Now I can use again, read CSV uh, to read that in. So that was called penguin data underscore one dot CSV. Yeah, so that's read in. So that turns up here. And you can see, again, I get some information on how that was read in. So don't be alarmed if that happens. That's not an error. Everything's fine. <laughs> um, so that works. Uh, I can also do uh, read delim. So read delim and tell R that the separator is a comma. So that works just the same. So that's the first data set, penguin data one. If we open the second one, we can see that instead of a comma, we now have a semicolon separating these values. So to read that in, we need either read underscore CSV two, right? because CSV2, so the CSV2 command assumes that the separator is a semicolon, which we have here. Oh, I need to change that. Okay. Or I can again use this. So read the limb and specify that the delimiter is a semicolon. And then the third one, that's actually, I'm just going to tell you that this is tap separated and we can do read TSV, right? So read TSV um, is for tap separated files. And then, yeah, same thing. We need to put in the name of the data um, of the file, penguin data 3txt So this is a text file. And then we can read that. Yeah, and it all shows up here it all shows us that we have 344 um, rows and eight columns. So that looks good. That looks correct. Okay. Uh, yeah, so I'll give you a minute to catch up. So you can use either of these commands. Um, they should all work. So make sure that you have the, uh, the penguins data set read in. They all contain the same data, really. It's just in a slightly different format. Um, so you can try all these different commands. So just make sure that you have one, one of these um, read in just so you have a data set to work with.
you know, once you have, you've read something in, um, try and explore that in this environment tab. So you can click on here to see um, the variables listed, right? And their data types. You can click on the name, right? To see the, the whole data set open up. And you can see that this is actually the view command. So view with a capital V. That's actually what opens up this um, preview. And that's something that's useful for smaller data sets. But if you have a really large data set, I would not try to use view because it's going to really slow down, um, really slow down your R. So that really only works with um, or works best with smaller data sets. Uh, Yudia, there's a question. Um, how do you use the read DLIM? So can you use that also for .txt files? Yeah, yeah, and you can also you can, use that. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah, sorry. sorry, maybe you can also show again um, how you find what separator character it's using yes. in read DLIM. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so yeah, I'm just going to open up um, the Penguin Data 1 CSV. So I'm just, I can just double click on it and it'll open in this text editor. So every, no matter which operating system um, you're, you're on, they will have some kind of a plain text editor, right? Um, and I can see that here I have species, comma, island, comma, and so on. So these are the different variables I have. So these are, this is the header, right? So these are the variable names. Um, and I can see which separator it is because here we have a comma, um, separating all these different variable names, right? So species, comma, this is the sign that will tell, uh, okay, this is where the first variable um, stops and the second variable begins, right? So that's how I know that it has a comma, right? Um, if I open Penguin Data 2, you can see that it has semicolons instead, right? So everywhere where we had a comma in Penguin Data 1, we now have a semicolon. Right, it's probably a bit small, but I don't, oh yeah, I can zoom in a bit, okay. All right, so that's how I know that it's, semicolon is the separator. If you, um, yeah, sometimes you can control this. So I think if you export data from, from an Excel file into a CSV or save it as a CSV, sometimes it'll let you control that. Um, but if you download data, you just have to, um, open it and look at it or try and read it into R and see um, which delimiter you need to, to um, display correctly. I can show you what happens um, if, you do the, if you do it wrong, right? So let me do it wrong so you can see um, what happens. So let's do, I'm just gonna call that penguins, right? And I will do a read, Oops, I'll do read CSV2 and I'll use the first penguin data. So I'll run that. And now we can see it says 344 observations of one variable. And if we look at that, we can see that R didn't recognize where the new columns start or supposed to start, right? So it didn't recognize this separator, this comma, because we used the wrong command, right? Or same thing if I did read um, delim and I said delim is um, semicolon, it'll do the same thing, right? It'll think it's one variable because it doesn't realize that this that the comma is used to say, okay, this belongs to the next column, this belongs to the next variable. Okay, so if you have some, if you, if you have a data set and you know that there are several variables in it, which is almost always the case, but R tells you it's only one variable, then something probably went wrong. So I can just fix that by using delim equals comma, which is correct. Okay, and now it looks fine and it puts the data into the correct columns. Okay, does that answer the question? Is that clearer? Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah, and so for the rest of these um, exercises, so here for, yeah, for two is just, we, we can take a look at this by clicking on it or by typing in 
um, view and then the name of the data frame. Oops. Start. Okay, now it's working. To get a preview, uh, so what happens if we do uh, call names? Okay, so this gives us all the names of the different variables of the different columns um, in the penguins data frame, right? So this reads out basically this first um, row because those are the column names. So it tells us which variables we have, okay? Um, and that's that's useful because um, here, like Kyla explained, it's really important to um, spell these exactly as they are safe. So if, if I try to um, get some information on the year, but I spell year with a capital Y, that's not going to work. Okay, so that's what call names does. Um, and we've seen head, right? We've seen the head command. And you can probably guess what the tail command does. So if you do tail, it'll show you the last six rows, right? So instead of the first six rows, it'll show you the last six rows. And you can, again, use something like n equals five in this case, and it'll show you the last five rows in your data. Okay, so let's see what happens if we try to access um, data that is in specific columns, right? So we'll go back to the jump data for this. So just to remind you, here we have eight participants, eight people, um, and we measured how tall they are and we measured how high they can jump, right? So um, if we do, we do call names on jump data, it'll tell us that the variables are participant, height underscore centimeter and jump underscore height. Yeah, so now let's say we only want to see the participants. So what we can do, and I'll actually type this out to show you something nice. So we can start typing jump and I will guess what I'm trying to do and will try to help me and suggest jump underscore data, right? So this data frame. So I can click on that to do kind of auto complete. Um, and now I want to see the only the participants, only the participant column. And the way to do that in R is using the dollar sign. And you could see as soon as I type that, it gave me a list or kind of a drop down menu of all the different variables in the data frame. Okay, so now I can I can either finish typing it or I can just click on it. And then I can run that code and it'll give me here. Th those are the participants, right? So A, B, C and so on. And I can do that for any other kind of that for any, any variable. Uh, in the data, if I can type it correctly, that is. So I can look at um, height and it'll give me all the different um, height measurements. Okay, and again, it's really important to match capitalization, right? So if I do, if I try height with a capital H, it'll tell me that this is an unknown column. Okay, so if you get an error like this, unknown or uninitialized column, it means you have a typo in there, right? So you can check, you can check that by clicking here and checking, oh, okay, height is with a small h, and then it works. Okay, yeah, and we've already seen that we can get um, some descriptive stats with um, summary. So just copy this over here. So we can use summary on an entire data frame. So we can do summary, uh, oops, jump data. And again, it'll try to autocomplete this for me. Here, we've already seen this, but now we can also use that to get information on one specific uh, variable. So I can do summary in brackets, jump data, and then dollar sign, because we need the dollar sign to refer to a variable in a data set. So I can do um, a summary just on how high people can jump. And then I get the same information again. So the minimum and maximum, uh, median, mean, and so on. Right. And I can also, if I only want the mean, for example, I can use the mean command on the height variable, for example. And I only get the mean, 168 is the average height. 
I can also use range. So range gives you the minimum and the maximum. So smallest person is 159 centimeters, tallest is 182, um, or I can use the median. Yeah, so this is how you can extract, um, yeah, basic information from your data, right? From your different variables. Are there any questions? Okay, so here's a little exercise. So use this um, penguin data set that you read in any of these. Again, it's the same data. Um, what is the range of flipper lengths? Okay, so that's question one. What's the range of flipper lengths? And the second question is save the mean body mass to a variable called average body mass. And then part two to this, this number is in grams. What will the equivalent be in kilograms? So just a few minutes for that. Okay, so for the first question, I think it's always a good idea to look at the variables in your data set while you're doing something like this to remind you uh, what these are called and how they are spelled. Okay, so we want the range of flipper lengths and we've seen the range command, right? So we can just use that again. So range and then in brackets and you can see that RStudio helpfully, every time you open a bracket, it'll close it, right? It'll add a closing bracket so you don't forget to do that um, because if you forget that, it will also give you an error message. Okay, so we have range, um, penguins, oops, is the name of our data set and we want a specific column. So we want flipper lengths, and you can see that this is called flipper underscore length underscore mm for millimeter. So you can select that. Okay, maybe that's a, a variable that has some an A's in it. Um, so what we can do is, yeah, okay. Okay, that's actually, uh, yeah, it's actually good that that happened because <laughs> that brings me to a good point. So here you can see if you look at the data um, that for some of these penguins, we just don't have information. So it says NA, right? Not available. We just don't have that data. Don't know how heavy they are and so on. Um, so then what you have to uh, add is this part. So I'll actually spell this out because it's a bit nicer. So this says if there are NA, so if there are missing values, just ignore them and do it anyway, right? So just ignore any missing values for flipper length. And then, yeah, and then it works. Okay, so that's the first part. So whenever you um, have missing values, there are several ways of, of dealing with these um, but if you just want to ignore them you can add this okay All right and then we want the mean uh, body mass and i'm expecting that maybe the same thing will happen here let's see okay so again we get na and again we need to add this part okay so now it's showing us the mean body mass for all these penguins in our data, um, but we actually want to save that to a variable, right? Called average body mass. And the way to do that is to use the, um, this arrow again. Okay. So average body mass. And now if I scroll down, you can see that this turned up here and you can see that it's 4,200 something. Okay. So now this is in grams, right? How do we find the, um, the weight in kilograms? We can do average body mass and we can just divide that by 1000. So the average penguin is 4.2 kilograms <laughs> in this data set. Okay, and then I think the final thing we'll do today um, is talk a bit more about factors or categorical um, columns. Um, Kai like gave an introduction to that already, um, but we'll yeah go into a little bit more detail today and it'll also come up again. All right, so if I have a look at the penguins data again, you can see we have species here, so different species of penguin. So if I scroll down, I can see, okay, here's Adelie, I think it's uh, pronounced. 
And then if I scroll down, it's um, Gentoo. And then if I scroll down even more, it's Chinstrap. So these are different species um, of penguins. So maybe I want to know now um, how many penguins per species do we have in this data set? So I would think, OK, I can just do a summary, right? But it'll tell me this is a character. So this is text. Um, and that's all it tells me, right? So the 344 is actually the number of rows rather than the number of penguins per species, OK? So this is a character. Um, uh, so this is what you, what you would call text data. This is a character vector. That's not useful here. Um, this should be a factor, factor at groups, right? So if you have something like um, discrete participant groups or conditions in an experiment or things like that, um, that should be factors, right? So we can see that this at the moment is a character. We can again use this class command, um, but we actually want this to be um, a factor, right? So we can use as factor here, I'm using underscore. You can also use a dot, right? Doesn't make too much of a difference. So I'm using that to overwrite the column. So I'm calling penguins species, the species column, um, and I'm putting that into as factor penguin species. Right. And you can see at the moment, if you look here, you can see that species says character next to it. So let me run this command. And you can see that it changed to factor. Okay. And it says um, factor with uh, three levels, right? So it tells us that we have three different species. Okay, now if we do class, we can see that uh, this is a factor. And if we run summary, we now get um, how many penguins per species do we have in this data set. Okay, so as a little exercise, um, have a look at the data and think about which other variables should be factors. So try and change these. If you find a variable in here that you think, oh, that's also a factor, really not a character, um, then go ahead and change them like we're doing here, right? And then the second question, how many entries from penguins who live on the dream island? So we have data from different islands. Um, and how many penguins do we have living on the dream island? OK, yeah, so in the interest of time, I'm also just going to move ahead. But you'll have the material. So if you want to go through it again and try the exercises um, in your own time, you can, of course, do that. OK, so if I look at the variables, species is a factor now. That's fine. Um, island should also be a factor. So let's do that. So penguins and then island. And let's use this arrow to assign that. And let's convert it into a factor. So as factor. And then the brackets again contain penguins, dollar, island. OK, so again, if you watch this here, island is now a character. And if I run this code, it's now a factor. OK, and you could do the same for sex, I think. You could also treat that, that as a factor. And now for the second question, so how many entries from penguins who live on the dream island do we have? We can just do summary penguins and island. OK, now you, we get it broken down into this the, the, the three islands we have. So we have 124 penguins from dream. OK, um, yeah, any questions? Um, just a quick question. So factor is basically for combining two different types of information together. So factors, you can think of factors as, as group labels, right? Um, so we want to group these penguins by which species um, they belong to or which island they're from, right, in this case. Um, so so that we can get information like this, so that we can count, so which penguins fall into which category, which pe um, how many penguins are from which island, how many penguins belong to which species. So we're adding, we're kind of labeling penguin one is from this island and this species and so on. Um, and that's what the factor does. Factors are group labels. If you have that as characters, like R reads it in by default, so R treats anything that isn't a number as a, as a character, as text. Um, and if we have that, then we can't do these analyses and we can't um, look at the data kind of aggregated in this way. Okay, thanks a lot. We'll talk about factors more. These are 
a bit confusing. This is the most difficult data type for sure. So we'll, this will come up again and again. Okay, any other questions? All right, so we had something else planned that we'll just um, do uh, next time kind of fits better into next time anyway. All right, so as a conclusion, you now know how to install R in R Studio. you've done that. Um, we've talked about scripts and our markdown. Um, we've talked about variables, um, data types, so numeric integer, um, character, factor, and we've talked about vectors. If you have um, several numbers or several um, words, we know how to install and load packages. Uh, we can read in files, we can read in different file types, um, no matter what the separator is, and we know how to look at uh, data frames in R um, and to get first info information um, on our data and on our variables in the data frame. So next time we'll get more into this tidyverse package um, that I had you install and load um, and we'll start um, playing around and changing our data. So things like renaming columns, creating new columns, um, reordering the data, filtering. So only looking at, for example, only looking at penguins from a specific island, things like that. So we'll really start working with um, our data next time. Okay. Okay, I'll just stop my screen share. Oops. Yeah, so thanks everybody for joining us. I hope you um, learned something. Um, yeah, other than that, we were happy to introduce you to R if this was your first um, introduction to R. I hope you enjoyed it and we hope to see you next time uh, in February.